Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Pre and Post Money Safes, Choosing the Right One for Your Startup. I'm Cassie Pallison, Head of Content here at Atrium and your moderator for today's webinar. Before I get into webinar logistics, I want to, or introducing the speaker, I want to tell you a bit about Atrium. Atrium is a full service corporate law firm that uses modern technology to deliver legal services that are fast, transparent, and price predictable. Founded by Justin Kahn and backed by Andreessen Horowitz, YC, General Catalyst, and more, we are trusted by over 300 of the top startups and hypergrowth companies in and outside of Silicon Valley. Now on to webinar logistics. This webinar will roughly be 45 minutes of content with Q&A at the end. You can submit questions at any point during the webinar on the left-hand side of your screen. Today, I'm excited to introduce to you our speaker, Jared Verzello. Jared primarily acts as outside counsel to venture-backed tech startups. He personally guides company, companies through general corporate matters, such as formation, fundraising, hiring employees, and managing board meetings. He also acts as a guide to Atrium's many specialists to help navigate through the unique challenges faced by many high-growth companies. Let's get started. All right, thank you everybody for joining today. We're going to go get into this. Um, we've got the agenda on the screen now. We're gonna do a really quick overview of the history of SAFES, kind of how we got here. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the key changes in the new Post Money Safe, which was uh, just published by YC back in, I wanna say October of 2018. So we're about six months into this now. And then most importantly, um, you know, for those of you who have been using safes for the last five years or so, we've now got these two options. So it's really important to understand how do I choose the best safe for my company, for my situation, and how do I really take actionable insights away from this presentation? So um, let's get into it. So as a reminder, short history of a safe. Um, the context here is you're raising money, right? You're funding your business. And the most fundamental way to think about that is you're selling a percentage of your company ownership for cash. Now, before safes, um, the, the most fundamental way to do this was you would literally issue people stock. You'd sell them preferred stock for a certain percentage of your company. And there's a bunch of reasons why that's great. There's a bunch of reasons why we use that transaction structure for series A and B and C. Um, but it's pretty time consuming and it has pretty high transaction costs. There's legal fees and there's a lot of management time involved with those tra uh, transactions. So, um, and uh, kind of a workaround is a convertible note and, and convertible notes are great. They basically are an IOU, right? They say, if you give me cash now, I understand that I owe you investor shares of my company, which I'll give you later. And later is when we do a price round, when we do an equity round. So it's really great. It's a great way to capitalize companies uh, with low transaction costs and to be able to really enable early stage startups to move fast. The issue with convertible notes is that technically they're debt instruments. And so as debt instruments under US law, they must carry an interest rate. They must have a maturity date. Um, and uh, at a more nuanced level, there's even some questions about interest income reporting and things like that for the investors. And so Y Combinator really took a, a really innovative move and they created the first safe and published it, which was really intended to be all of the best components of a convertible note, right? Low transaction costs, a way to capitalize businesses quickly with a promise for equity in the future but they came up with a solution which they believed got around the pitfalls of debt uh, issuance in the United States. So no interest rate, right? No maturity date. Um, you don't have to worry about hitting a maturity date a year after you do your note financing and then maybe an investor who's not bullish on your company anymore actually wants their money back, plus the interest that they've accrued. That can be a disaster for an early stage business. So they came up with the safe as a way to get around these things. And, and really, I think um, it took Silicon Valley by storm. It, it took a few years to gain momentum, but I would say in my practice, the vast majority of companies 
companies in Silicon Valley raising early convertible kind of pre-seed angel friends and family rounds are all using SAFEs. And it's definitely gaining popularity throughout the United States and um, to, a, to a lesser extent throughout the world. It's really designed to comply with U.S. laws, so it's, it's not as popular internationally. Um, but, but kind of the nucleus was here in Silicon Valley, and, and it's very strong here. Now, um, this kind of um, – so I guess, I guess uh, this leads us to um, the evolution of the safe, which is the new post-money safe. And here I've kind of got a slide which shows you some of these some of these things that I was that I was talking about. Um, you know, you're selling a percentage of your company for cash. You're using standard transaction uh, standard documents to lower transactions costs. But um, the original safe, which was published in 2013, was a pre money safe, meaning let's decide what the value of the company is today before we get any investment at all, and then we can just tax safes onto that valuation. Right? I built a business. We all think it's worth four, five, six million dollars, and I can tack on a hundred thousand dollar safe, and then another twenty-five thousand dollar safe, and then a two hundred fifty thousand dollar safe, and I can just keep tacking on those safes um, with the same assumption that the business kind of before all that investment is worth X, and then we can just tack on as much fundraising as as the market will give us access to it. So the evolution of the safe is that YC changed that from a pre-money valuation to a post-money valuation, meaning when we're deciding what is the value of the business, we're no longer thinking about it in terms of before the investment dollars come in, but after the investment dollars come in. So if you've got a business that's worth $5 million, plus you're raising a $100,000 safe, that means the post-money valuation is $5.1 million or $5,100,000. So this actually creates a lot of benefits, um, but some downsides. And I want to get into that um, eventually, that's kind of the pre versus post. But then but the next thing that I want to get into is just doing a deeper dive on the exact changes. Because they're not limited to just um, determining the valuation on a pre-money versus a post-money basis. Um, so without going into all of the nitty-gritty details, which I think are probably more interesting for lawyers than they are for most clients, um, let me, let me hit a couple of highlights. So the first point is now at the top of the post money safe, and by the way, these are all published on Y Combinator's website. They're, they're open source documents. You're able to use them, and, and uh, you can even modify them for non-commercial purposes. But at the very top of the new post money safe, there's basically a legend that says, hey, this is the same post money safe that is published on YC's website. And what that prevents people doing is going into the kind of body of the document and changing things without anybody, you know, being on notice. Because one of the benefits of using a safe is that there's standard terms that come with the safe. So hopefully if you're fundraising and you and an investor agree, we're going to do a safe financing, everybody really knows what terms come with that. And the only thing that you really have to negotiate is what's the company's valuation and how much money are we going to raise. But you don't have to go through line item by line item. Now, occasionally people would go in there and tweak things and may not highlight it to people. So they thought they were getting the standard safe deal, but then they signed a document maybe without reading it closely. And, and there's now a bunch of things that are changed and they thought they were getting pro router rights and they ripped those out and they didn't realize it. So now there's this legend at the top, which really encourages transparency and just says, hey, this is a standard safe. And if you've changed anything, you really have to remove that legend. And if you don't, I think the idea is that the parties are held to the standard of the the standard terms of the safe. So that's actually kind of nuanced, but, but interesting and important and helps keep those transactions costs low because the parties know what terms they're getting into without necessarily feeling like they have to do a word by word reading of that document, which can be pretty legal heavy and, and a bit dry. Um, so, so the other thing which I mentioned about the pro rata rights is this is a big departure. Um, in the original pre-money uh, pre safe, Every investor received pro rata rights after the safe converted. So, so what does that mean? Let's say that you're doing a pre-seed round for your safe financing, and then you raise your first equity round, and you call that your seed round. And then after that, you go on to raise a Series A. So you've got kind of a pre-seed, seed, and Series A. What that meant in the old system was you buy your safe at your pre-seed round. You get no pro rata rights at the seed round. 
But then when the A finally comes along, every single safe in data rights. And this was kind of different. I think a lot of people found this a bit confusing and it really didn't distinguish between large strategic investors who are typically thought of as the key kind of recipients of pro rata rights and, and everybody else. Um, so the change here was that they ripped the pro rata rights out of the safe altogether and they have published a standalone side letter which contains pro rata rights and they've really simplified the process which is now the default for post money safes are no investors get pro rata rights there's no skipping the seed round anymore and coming back in at the age just nobody gets pro rata rights unless you specifically negotiate for and the company grants you pro rata rights in which case you'll enter into a separate side letter agreement that governs your pro rata rights and i think this is a good move i really like this i think it keeps things simple um, uh, another another point is that um, the safes are now what we call amendable by a majority in interest, which just means that you can actually treat the safes as a round now. So if you think about a Series A round, all of the investors come in, maybe they're investing six or seven million dollars total, and they all get rights, they all get similar rights. And then if you need to negotiate anything with your investors, you go to the investors and you ask for consent. And once a majority typically of the investors consent, then you can change things or you can raise another round of financing or you can sell your company or do whatever, but you can do things based on majority rule within the investor class. In the old pre-money safes, there was no such thing as kind of majority rule or, or majority consent. Every single safe holder had a standalone document. And if you wanted them to consent to something, you had to get their specific sign off. And so what you could do is you could find yourself having a, a safe round of $1 million and having got um, $980,000 of those investors to agree to your amendment and kind of chasing around four or $5,000 checks. And it ended up being very administratively burdensome. And it really wasn't relevant that often, but um, I think as YC was doing this amendment and changing the safe, they realized that this was a, a good opportunity to kind of conform to indus industry standards, which is kind of majority rule within the investor class. We realized that the investors have aligned incentives and that it would be very unusual for $980,000 of the 1 million to want to do something and the 20,000 to not want to do that. So um, I think this was a good move on their part and makes it a little bit more founder friendly and company friendly. Um, uh, there's also some uh, some changes to kind of agreed accounting treatment and and agreed uh, liquidation treatment in the case of a dissolution or an early kind of aqua hire. A little bit cut and dry or a little bit dry there. Um, uh, some of that stuff was a little bit ambiguous before because safes were a brand new invention and there wasn't a lot of legal precedent on how to deal with some of these kind of uh, nuanced concepts. And so I think YC capitalized on the opportunity here to just put those in the contract and, and clarify some of those things. Uh, but again, kind of that's probably a little bit more of interest for any attorneys that we have who are, who are looking to level up on this rather than founders. And, and all this kind of leads us to, to, the, to the next kind of big point, which is it's a post money safe and it's not a pre money safe anymore. And that's what I touched on at the beginning. And, and this is really where we're going to spend the majority of our, our substantive time, because this is really critical. Um, all the other stuff are kind of small tweaks, little improvements. I don't think they're very controversial. I think there's, you know, an area for reasonable minds to disagree about whether or not a pre-money safe or a post-money safe is in the best interest of which companies. And so let's try to all level up on that and spend some time here. So in my opinion, this slide that we're on right now is the most challenging slide of the presentation. Um, I know it's dense. Um, but I think this is a good thing to kind of have bookmarked and revisit and try to level up on over time. So it's challenging, but it's also the most important concept that we're going to cover today. And it really, at its, at its core, goes back to venture math and how well the reader understands venture math concepts and is able to translate kind of the natural language, the natural contract language of legal documents into 
mathematical formulas where you can then kind of plug them into a model and optimize and see what might be in the best interest of your company. So um, for this slide, you know, what I'm asking everyone to do is kind of take my word that I have gone through painstakingly in the documents and the contracting language, and I have translated them into a slightly simplified but accurate um, mathematical formula here. So the idea is if you understand each of these variables, right, if you understand what the state price is, if you understand what the pre-money valuation cap is, if you understand what the company capitalization is, you can plug in the specific numerical um, values for your particular company and your financing situation, and it will spit out a number that's accurate and that tracks to the safe documents. Um, but before we get into that, I think that the, the simplest approach to understanding the difference between the pre-money and the post-money capitalization um, um, impact here is the following. The investor, meaning the person who's purchasing the safe, right? The investor will not take any dilution from any interest that's represented in the denominator of these formulas. Okay? Again, the investor will not take dilution from any interest that's represented in the denominator. Now, if you look at the formulas, the denominator is the same, right? It's capital C, company capitalization. Now, that's a defined term in the contract. And the way that that term is defined changes from the pre-money safe to the post-money safe. So that's why underneath that I have company cap equals. Now, that's the definition. So you'll see it's, a, it's its own formula. But let me just, before I dig into this, make sure that we're all understanding what I say when investor will not take dilution. Think about a company that raises a Series A and then a Series B. And let's say the investors buy 20% of the company at the Series A. I think intuitively we all understand that, okay, now the investors own 20% of the company and everybody else owns the remaining 80% of the company, which totals to 100%. When you go on to raise that Series B and new investors come in and say buy another 20% of the company, everybody in the Series A cap table takes that dilution, right? The Series B investors are are buying 20%, and that 20% comes out of every other shareholder's piece on, an, on a percentage basis, okay? So they all take the dilution. What I'm saying when I say the investors will not take dilution from any interest represented in the denominator is this. If you're a Series A investor and you own about 20% of the company, and if the Series B interest was in your denominator, then when the company goes and sells that 20% to the Series B investors, you don't take any dilution as a Series A investor. Normally, you would take another 20% dilution. It would be material, but you wouldn't take any here. So the actual concept of Series A and Series B is not, is, is not actually applicable for states. But what I'm trying to do is use the most basic formula that people are familiar with to, to communicate the principle. So let's dive in now about this dilution and, and, and understanding this dilution really helps one identify which formula is in the best interest for their company. So um, the things that are the same are, and again, this is, this is, these are all the things that do not create dilution for the safe investor, okay? So all of the outstanding stock at the time of the company, right? Your co-founder, you and your co-founders have shares outstanding when you sell the company, when you sell part of the company to your safe investor. You understand that you're the ones taking the dilution from their investment. The, the safe investor isn't going to take dilution from their own investment. That's very intuitive. But that's what that's all that outstanding company stock means. Um, in the same vein, outstanding options, right? If you have employees who are on your cap table who have options, perhaps they haven't exercised them yet, so they're not shareholders but they really have a claim to a percentage of the company and the understanding is they will exercise them eventually. Again, investors don't take dilution from that. That's very intuitive. We kind of understand those people were already there in the company on the cap table and, and we expect them to, to be diluted in this, in this fundraising event. The option pool, 
again, that's that's where the options come from. It's a pool reserve that the company sets aside for future equity incentives for hires. When you, in the old pre-money safe, there was an understanding that this is a convertible round and eventually you'll do a, a full-blown equity financing. And when you do that, that lead investor will negotiate a certain size of option pool that they want you to have as an incentive for them to come in and make their investment. And that that new investor at the equity round wouldn't be diluted by that option pool top up. Normally that, that number is 10%. They want you to have a 10% pool. So what would happen is you'd be a you'd be a seed stage company. You'd have some shares outstanding. You maybe had made one, two, three, four hires, and you'd have five percent of the company left in your option pool for future hires. And you go on and you do your Series A. Well, if that new equity investor wants you to top your pool up from five percent to ten percent, that's five percent of the company. That's a material amount. The new investor is not going to take any dilution from that. And under the pre money safe neither would your existing stakeholders. When you, when you added an extra 5% of the company to that pool, that would not dilute any of your existing stakeholders, right? Those people would put in 10,000 or 100,000 or $250,000. So what that means is that extra 5% would come out of the shares of all of the existing team, including the founders. So that was the way it's been since 2013. Um, and, and that has now changed for the, for the post-money state. YC is now taking a different approach. And what they're saying is, you know what? Oftentimes what we see now is um, safe investments really look more like safe rounds as opposed to small bridge loans or one-off financing concepts. So when you have a round, you know, the Series A investors, if we're going back to our kind of traditional model of Series A, Series B, you know, the Series A investors, if they invested and then a year or two years later, your company went on to raise a Series B and you had to top up your option pool, well, that top up would dilute all of the Series A investors. That's normal. So since safe financing often look like safe rounds now, YC conceded that it, it makes sense to exclude the option pool top up from that, from that um, dilution carve out. So... I think that makes sense and is fair and really models what we would expect to see in a Series A and Series B scenario. And, and really what we're saying, the new Series A is really a safe round, right? And that's kind of what this is getting at, which I think fits the mental model of a lot of us who, who do a lot of these transactions and see companies regularly, you know, maybe raising two hundred fifty to 500000 on an early seed, uh, you know, pre-seed round, friends and family or some early angel investors, maybe using that for six to 12 months and then going on and raising, you know, easily a one or $2 million round on a safe and sometimes even a three or $4 million round on a safe and using that for another 12 to 18 months of runway before they really engage with their first equity round financing. So this is just kind of YC adapting to the way that the safes are being used by the market. I think it makes a lot of sense. The key difference here, however, is what I've put in bold, which is converting securities or in other words, other states and convertible notes. And remember, my simple takeaway here is anything in the denominator does not dilute your safe investors. So what we're doing here is we're now adding safes and notes to the, denom to the denominator. So what does that mean? What it means is if you raise $100,000 from a safe and then one week later, raise another $100,000, and then a week later, raise another $100,000, and then a week later, raise another $100,000. If those had all been done as equity rounds, which is really unrealistic because you know the transaction costs are too high to justify doing an equity round for a $100,000 investment, but to demonstrate it, if those had all been equity rounds, so you called that your Series A, Series B, Series C, Series D, at each new equity issuance, your prior investors would receive some dilution, Right? because your Series A investors get diluted by Series B, and your Series A and B get diluted by Series C. Well, under the new post-money safe, what this is saying is all of those subsequent safe issuances or subsequent convertible note issuances, the prior post-money safe holder doesn't receive any dilution from those folks. So what that means is if you could enter into an agreement with a party that says, hey, I'm going I'm to value your company at 
a $5.1 million post money valuation. Or in other words, we think your company is worth $5 million. We'll put in $100,000. That's a $5.1 million post money safe valuation. And then as you raise another $100,000 and then another $100,000 and another $100,000, that in the $5.1 million valuation, they don't take any dilution from those subsequent investments. Which another way of thinking about that is they're saying, we're not going to give you any credit for increasing your company valuation, even though you've put an extra $300,000 in your bank. And normally you would think, hey, my company, all things being equal, if I have an extra $300,000 in the bank, I'm worth $300,000 more because I have that much more operating capital. And, and if you live in Silicon Valley and fundraise here, really it's you even get a multiplier on that because of all the things you can potentially do with your $300,000 and the growth that you can create and the market share that you can capture. So this is actually a very big deviation from the pre-money save. And it's not a bad thing. It's just a different framework for thinking about your fundraising. And so um, if, we, if we kind of go into the actual math behind it, it changes the way that you do round construction and the way that you think about taking dilution. And um, at the most fundamental level, what you really want to make sure you're doing is when you're creating that post money save, you're not thinking about, hey, what's my pre money valuation plus the amount that this investor is putting in, right? My 5 million plus 100,000 is I'm a 5.1 million post money valuation. You really want to think about, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise $100,000 from each of these four individuals over the course of the next month. So really, I want to sign up each of them on a $5.4 million post money save. Right, because that way I get the credit of having all four hundred thousand dollars operating capital, and now they are all in the same pool together, and I don't have to worry about any of them carving out the dilution from the others. So that's really important, and that's different from the pre-money save because you didn't really have to think about that before. All you have to do is decide what's my value today, and I can just keep tacking on investment as long as I have market interest. Now you have to take a little bit more thoughtful approach and really treat it as a round and think about. Hey, what kind of round can I raise? How big can it be? Et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and, and, and that's a little bit harder to do, frankly, right? Because a lot of times when we're in the early days of fundraising, we don't know how much interest we have. We don't know how much money we may be able to attract. Um, and, and this just kind of, I think, requires a slightly more measured and aggregated approach to fundraising. But now let's actually dive into the math and look at well, all things being equal, if I chose to do a pre-money safe versus a post-money safe, how much of the company would I be selling? And so in order to do this, again, this is kind of a, a venture math, an exercise of venture math, which a lot of, uh, a lot of um, founders, you know, kind of sporadically immerse themselves in, right? You might fundraise every year or every two years and you kind of knock the rust off and, and remind yourself how this works. And then you have investors who deal with it more, and then you have venture lawyers who, like me, who just deal, deal with this stuff every single day. So um, when we're doing our kind of back of the envelope venture math, and you're thinking about, hey, I know I'm, I know I'm raising $100,000 from this investor, how much of my company am I selling to her? Really, the, the, the back of the envelope math is, is not that hard. You, you take the investment amount, and you divide it by the pre-money valuation, over the investment amount, or in other words, the post money valuation. So um, let's look at scenario one, right? We're going to raise $500,000 on a $4.5 million pre money valuation. That's 10% of the company, right? And all that is, is it's $500,000 over $4.5 million plus $500,000 equals 10%. So that 10%, remember I said these are IOUs, right? They don't actually get the shares yet, but in my scenario here, right, January 2019, we do the safe round. We raised five on 4.5. And then a year later, we actually end up doing our equity round. At that point in time, the safes actually convert into preferred stock. And it'll be approximately 10% of the company on a kind of pre-equity round basis. Um, so that's how that works. In scenario number two, which is a more common scenario, there's going to be two convertible round or two safe financing rounds before we finally make it to our equity round. So on January 2019, I raised my 500000 on a $4.5 pre, right? And 
again, that's an IOU. There's no dilution that's happened yet today because none of the dilution happens until we raise the equity round. So ignore that for a second. Because if you just looked at that line item alone, that would that should be 10%, right? Because it's 500 over 5 million is 10%. But that's not actually what happens in reality. This, this conversion event happens later. So then three months later, two months later, we realize we got some momentum here. We're gonna strike while the iron's hot. We're gonna take more money. We're gonna raise another 500,000, but because we have a lot of interest, we're gonna raise our pre-money valuation. And by the way, we've got another $500,000 in the bank and we wanna get credit for that. So you raise another 500,000 on a 5 million pre, and now the, the one line item kind of math on that would be 500,000 divided by 5.5 million but again, what we have to do is we have to wait until January 2020 and then calculate how all of these notes convert. And because this is a pre-money safe, and if you go back one slide, which I'll do right now, if you go back one slide, you'll see that in the pre-money safe column, the convertible instruments, the convertible securities are not in the denominator, right? Because they're not included in the definition of company capitalization. So if they're not in the denominator, what that means is that the safe investors will be diluted by those issuances. So now let's go back to our scenario slide. So what that means is we have a two separate rounds. They're both converting immediately prior to the equity round on January 2020. And because neither of them included the other in its denominator, they both take dilution from each other. So, and that's what I've tried to represent in the black parentheticals beneath each line item, right? You know where the 10% comes from. That's the 500,000 divided by 4.5 million plus 500,000. That's kind of the, the, the percentage ownership we would expect if there were no other diluting events. But we also know that um, the 500,000 divided by 5.5 million right, that we would expect to sell them 9.1%, right, because 500 over 5.5 million equals 9.1. So what we have to do is we have to dilute each of these by the other's relative state. So it ends up being pretty straightforward, right? You, you multiply the 10% by the dilution from the second round, you multiply the 9.1% by the dilution from the first round, and you get this result where instead of converting it to 10%, these investors convert into 9.1% and 8.2% respectively because all of that dilution didn't come out of the founding team. The, the investors had to eat their own pro rata portion of the, the round dilution from each other. So this is a, this is a pretty good result. And what it, what it ends up with is about 17.3% you know, of the company would be owned by the safe holders immediately prior to doing the equity round. Now, the reality is then you'd come in and do the equity round. You typically sell 20 to 30% of your company, and those investors would have even more dilution at that point. But maybe they choose to participate in that round, in which case they'd kind of gross themselves up. But that's kind of beyond the scope of today's conversation. But I just want to lay the, the order of operations for how you do this math, because as we all know, order of operations is really important for getting the math correct. And that is how you do it. So... Um, if you're still with me, that's great. I know that this is really heavy and, and, and I've really tried to kind of lay this out as best I can. Um, but I, I totally realize that you may need to spend some time with these slides and work with you know competent advisors and legal counsel to really digest this and understand this. But let's now change gears and sit and look at the exact same scenarios, but a founder who maybe isn't really paying attention to pre-money safe versus post-money safe, and they're just grabbing the most recent thing off the YC website, which is the post-money safe, and they're just slapping numbers on there and using the same kind of mental model that they've used since 2013 on the old pre-money safes. So let's see if you kind of do that, which I think a lot of people are doing right now and not really fully understanding the difference between these, these vehicles. Um, what situation might you get yourself into if you do that? So scenario three, right? You have your initial fundraising round, you do 500K on a 5 million post, and you equal 10%. Now here we're giving credit to the, to the entrepreneur that, hey, they get the difference between pre-money and post-money valuation. Like that's not rocket science. That's stuff that we're, all, that we're all used to engaging with when we're thinking about equity rounds. So 
they're not going to make the mistake of doing a post money safe and giving a 4.5 million valuation. They understand that it's a 4.5 million plus the amount they're raising. The amount they're raising is five, so that gives them a five million post, and it's a 10 percent dilution on that case. So that scenario is the same as scenario one, you know, with the assumption that you've correctly priced it at a post money and not made the mistake of pricing a post money safe at a pre money valuation. Scenario four, I think, is winning. Okay. So January 2019, you raised 500, 500K on a 5 million post. Okay. And again, at this point, let's just ignore the percentage dilution because you haven't taken any dilution yet. You just have an IOU to investors to give them shares in the future. A few months later, you've got some momentum. It's time to take more money off the table, but you're going to give yourself credit for that earlier 500K that you raised. So you bump up your post money valuation by 500K and you, and you take another 500 thousand dollar investment fast forward nine months you've got momentum you're you're doing a real equity round and now it's time to calculate the conversion percentages so again let's let's look at the black parentheticals the first number here the 10 percent and 9.1 percent respectively are the numbers that we would assume the safe investors from that round to hold if they were the only safe round Okay, and that's just the simple five over five hundred k over uh, sorry five hundred thousand over five million and five hundred thousand over five point five million. So that's ten and nine point one respectively. But now they're still going to take dilution. Um, what they're going to take dilution from changes here. They're not going to take dilution. And let's and let's go back one slide to our 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 formulas here. So if you look in the post money safe column, now we're looking at all of the, defini the definition of the company capitalization within the post money safe. What are the things that they take dilution from? What are the things they don't take dilution from? Again, anything listed in the denominator, you will not take dilution as an investor. So the big item here is the convertible, the converting securities, right? The thing in our pre money scenario was, hey, we have two safe rounds. Those are both converting securities. Each of those rounds dilutes the other. Well, now in the post money safe, the converting securities are in our denominator, which means our investors will not take dilution from those. So it, it's actually irrelevant that we did two safe rounds in the post money safe because it doesn't matter if it's two safe rounds or five safe rounds or 10 safe rounds. Those investors don't take dilution from those safe rounds. So the question is, what do they take dilution from? And what we have to look at is that parenthetical at the very last point uh, sorry, I changed slides too soon. The parenthetical of the very last point under the company capitalization of post money safe, which is the pool is included, but the top up is not. Again, I know this is really, I'm, I'm almost talking in circles here, but the thing that we're looking for is what is not included in my denominator because I have to take the dilution from that. And the thing that's not included in the denominator of the post money safe is the option pool top up. Okay, so now let's go back to our scenario slide. So now look at the black parentheticals. I'm assuming here, and I have a little asterisk, you know, explaining my assumptions, but I'm assuming that this company is going to do a 5% top up, right? So they raised some money on their pre-money saves. They raised a million bucks. They probably spent almost all of that if they've gotten themselves all the way to an equity round. They've issued say 5% of the company to early employees, and they still have 5% of the company reserved for future employees. Now it's January, 2020. They're in term sheet negotiations with their lead investor for their equity round. And the lead investor is saying, love your company, but we need to get that option pool back up to 10%. I need you guys to have a 10% pool. That's very, very typical. So what that means is you need to top your pool up by another 5% to get you from five to 10. And because that top up is not in the denominator of your post money safe calculation, all of your safe investors, your post money safe investors are going to eat some of that dilution. And they're going to, you know, they're going to eat their pro rata portion of that. So that's what we're, that's what I've represented here in these black parentheticals. You've got somebody who you would expect to get 10% of the company, except now we need to figure out what's going to be diluted for them. It's going to be the option pool top up. We've assumed an option pool top up of 5%, which is going to take them from 10% down to 9.5%. And in the case of the 9.1%, it 
down to 8.7%. And the math, hopefully, if you've kind of been following along and, and listening to this, you're you're following the math and you can kind of work through, oh, I get it, it's a 5% pool, so they take 5% dilution um, on their respective shares. So does everybody else on the cap table. That's how we make 5% open on the cap table. And, um, and, and that's where you get. So what you end up with is at the equity round, immediately before you bring on those new investors, all of your safes convert, and they're going to represent eight, about 18 points. And, you know, bear with me a little bit, because when we do this in reality, we actually build Excel models, and they're much more sophisticated, and we drill down, you know, to, to you know, multiple decimal points, and this is very precise, and it's a big part of round construction. But trying to give you the back of the envelope math to present the concepts, um, you know, allow me some flexibility to have kind of approximate math here on this. So what, what you're seeing is 17.3% versus 18.2% dilution based on whether or not you use the pre or the post money save. And again, I'm assuming that you didn't make any dumb mistakes like use a post money save and do a pre money valuation, right? Like that just makes things worse for you. But if all things being equal, if you use a pre money save versus a post money save in this situation, you're talking about almost an extra 1% dilution, which is a material amount. Right. I mean, imagine imagine doing that a few times um, or or think about it like this. What kind of talent could you hire early in your company for one percent of the company? That's 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 an executive hire or a very senior hire or some ver a couple of very good hires at the very least, if not more. Um, so it really puts into context um, getting this right, because equity is one of the most valuable forms of compensation that you have as an early stage business that's that's typically cash poor okay so um assuming people's heads haven't exploded yet with all of that let's kind of go back and 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 revisit kind of these key changes so um and, and i'll just quickly read through these but you know you have these slides to digest them um it's easier to track your ownership and dilution on a post money safe because there's only one variable that you have to think about, which is your option pool top up. And typically that's pretty small, you know, it's typically going to be five or less, 5% or less. Whereas if you're trying to figure out your relative equity percentages with pre money safes, you've got to go, you've got to jump through all these hoops to figure out all my other safes. How do they dilute my former safes? How do the former safes dilute the louder safes? They become pretty complicated to keep all that straight. Um, and so what happens oftentimes is you end up building that full Excel model with your attorney at the equity round and you realize, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize exactly how much of the company I had sold in those safe rounds. Um, you know, and, and, you know, worst case scenario is, you know, you really regret it and feel like you would have done things differently had you known. Um, but, you know, second point here fundamentally is just it's the math is different. The math is different. Um, and, and, and you can't apply the mental model you have for calculating the math of a pre-money safe with a post-money safe because it just doesn't work the same way. Um, uh, the zero pro rata rights, I think, is, is helpful and is founder-friendly. Um, identifying the, the instrument as that same instrument that's, that's published on YC's website is helpful and helps keep the transaction costs low and make sure that neither party is trying to pull a fast one on the other. Um, that's helpful. Um, and then some of these other things we, we, we went over earlier, and I won't spend any more time on them because they're a little bit more of legal nuance. Um, so, so we'll kind of carry on. Yeah, so now, now that we've kind of done the deep dive on how to do the math and calculate these things, the question really becomes, okay, that's interesting. That's pretty dense. Is there a simple framework that I can use um, having listened to the presentation and gotten on board with the fact that like, Hey, I, I think this person knows what he's talking about. This sounds, this sounds right. But I, I just don't have the you know mental space to keep all this top of mind. Cause I've got too many other things that are important to me that I'm doing. Can I have a mental model and a framework to take away here that I know is based off of this deep dive that this expert has done. And I think the answer is kind of, um, I think so. But, you know, these are early days and the market is still telling me what it's going to do with this information. But here's what I think is going to happen. So 
if you are fundraising a convertible round and you have a high degree of confidence that your next fundraising activity will be a price round, okay, then I think that you're pretty, you should be pretty comfortable doing the post money saves. Overall, if you're not careful, you can take, you can end up taking more dilution from post money saves, but that really only happens when you follow a safe round with another safe round. If you follow your safe round with a priced round, you avoid you. And, and then what you get is you're not, you're not kind of getting the worst aspect of it and you're getting all the benefits of the cleanup and, and all the things that I, that I kind of gave short attention to, but are actually really important. So do I think that after I raise this 500,000, 1 million, $2 million, my next round will be a full blown equity round with a, with a lead venture investor. Yeah. then post money safe is probably a pretty good bet for you. If you don't have a high degree of confidence that your next round is going to be a an priced equity round, I would I would say that post money safe is risky, and and you probably should err on the side of doing the pre money safe, and you know you'll give away maybe pro rata some pro rata rights to people who you otherwise might not have, but you're going to ensure that all of those safe investors take the dilution from subsequent rounds. So if you follow six months later with another safe round, then at least you know you're sharing that dilution burden with your with your prior investors. And most people, I think, would rather give people pro rata rights and share dilution than, than the opposite. So how do you, that kind of leads to the question of, well, how do I know if my next round is going to be a priced round? And that's a hard question to ans- answer because it's very context dependent. Um, so here's a rough framework that I think would be pretty easy to poke holes in, but I, I'm going to err on the side of trying to be helpful and give you a rough framework. But just know this really depends. This is a multivariable analysis. It depends on who your current investors are. What kind of access to capital do you have? What kind of operating and success history do you have as a founding team? What industry you're in, right? Fundraising in consumer tech versus biotech, completely different, right? Completely different capital needs. So with that kind of caveat, um, I think what we'll probably see happen as people get educated on these instruments and start to see the pros and cons of each is that if you're raising less than a million dollars, you're going to be using a pre-money save. And the reason for that is I'm just not confident that many people will raise less than $1 million and then follow that up with a full-blown price equity round. I just don't see it happen very much. And, and typically, you just don't have enough runway to, to do that. If you're raising more than $2 million, I think what we're going to see is as investors really level up on these instruments, they're going to start demanding that people use a post money safe. Um, and I think they're going to have a realistic argument that, hey, if you've raised $2 bucks, you can get to a you can get to a price round, even if it's a small price round. And as an investor based, we want some of the added securities and assurances that come with the post money safe. So I think that's what will happen. I think in between the one and $2 million range, which frankly is a lot of companies who are raising saves, a lot of companies are in the one to $2 million range. Um, I think it could go either way, but I think as a founder, you want to really exert your influence over leaning toward the pre-money safe because you want to err on the side of being cautious and you want to err on the side of maybe giving pro router rights away, but making sure that if you don't get to an equity round in your next round, that your investors are sharing the dilution with you. So um, we're going to make sure we have some time to address some uh, comments that have come in and some questions that have come in. This conclusion slide really kind of sums up um, everything. And, and I won't read this verbatim because I've just gone through this. But if you read this conclusion slide and you feel like you're following it, you followed all the points, you felt like they were articulated well, and that you know even if you couldn't maybe – turn around and explain it to somebody yourself, but you have a high degree of confidence in these conclusions, I think that's a win for this presentation because I think this is a pretty dense subject matter. Um, the one thing I'll highlight is please don't take away that pre-money safe is better than post-money safe. That's an oversimplification. They're really different tools that have different applications and they look very similar but a nuanced understanding of these investment vehicles will really allow a founding team to optimize their fundraising. And I think it's important 
when you're looking for legal counsel to make sure you're talking to somebody who really understands the differences and isn't just assuming that they're all the same uh, because it matters. It really matters. And it, it matters about how much uh, dilution you take. It matters about setting expectations with your investors and about your ability to continue to hire top talent and have equity to do that. So with that being said, um, let's jump into some questions. Great. Okay. If you can just submit your questions in the left-hand side of your screen, we'll jump right into the few that have come in along the way. Why does the value of a company change before and after raising? There isn't much difference before and after. If a value, the valuation of a company is representative of value, how is it that the value changes in such a short period of time? Yeah, th this is a great question. And really, there's a little bit of an equivocation in this because we're using the term value or valuation of a company. But in the venture world, we really have um, – dissected this into there's pre-money value and there's post-money value. And the pre-money value is all of the value that the business brings to the table before they do any fundraising. And the post-money value is all of that value plus the capital that they've raised, right? Because you could, you could th think of two companies that have the exact same team, exact same intellectual property, exact same product roadmap, and exact same go-to-market strategy, but one has a million dollars in the bank and one has $5,000 in the bank. You know, intuitively, we would all agree that, well, yeah, the, the company with a million dollars in the bank is a lot more valuable because they actually have the operating capital to execute on their strategy and to acquire top talent. So that's really why it changes, right? Is because you brought a bunch of value to the thing. Your pre, now, your pre money value hasn't changed immediately after the financing. That's the same. But now, your post money value has changed because you have operating capital. And some people would even argue that your pre money value has changed because now you've got the capital to actually execute on your plan. And that makes your plan even more valuable, but that's kind of splitting it. Great. Um, is it a good idea to use your pre money in your first safe fundraising and post and use post money in your second, if you know you have a price round next? I think you kind of touched on that. I did touch on this a little bit. And I think um, I think that's not a bad idea. And and actually, in my opinion, I think this is really captured by the framework which I set, which is if you think your next fundraise is going to be an equity round, you're okay to do a, a post-money safe. If you think your next fundraise is going to be another convertible round, and that could be either safes or convertible notes, then you probably better do a pre-money safe. So if we look at it kind of in a chronological order, your first round, you're raising some money, you know, because of the way this question is structured, we're assuming two, two convertible rounds before you get to an equity round. So if you've got the crystal ball and you're looking into it clearly and you have perfect forecasting, which is sometimes difficult to do, but that first round you're thinking, well, I know I'm going to raise another safe round, so this round I ought to do a pre-money safe. And then at that second safe round, you're not really looking retrospectively. Um, you're saying, what's my next fundraising round going to be? I think my next fundraising round is going to be an equity round. So on this fundraising round, I'm going to do a post-money save. Um, so yeah, I think you can do that. Now, I don't think it's as simple as saying you should always do two safe rounds. The first one should always be a pre. The second one should always be a post. Then you should go into a, an equity round. It's just, it's unfortunately not that cut and dry. But I do think that the framework holds up even in this, and it allows for some optimization within the fundraising rounds for how you're going to structure it. Great. So in, uh, you mentioned in the post-money saves, there's a majority investor approval. Is that the majority of the number of investors or the majority of the amount of money invested? It's the majority of the amount of money invested. And so there's different kind of terms that this goes by, and there's, there's a lot of jargon with legal terms. But... It's what we typically call a majority in interest, right? So, uh, you know, and I, I use kind of like a, an analogy of, of, of democratic voting or majority rule when I was explaining it, which is a little misleading because in venture, it's not one person, one vote, it's one dollar, one vote, right? So, so um, that, that really is what governs here. And so if you have a round where you have one large investor who's bought 60% of the round and everybody else comprises 40%, then you might just need to go to one person and that consent is enough to drag everybody along 
And again, the idea there is they should really have aligned incentives. The 60% holder in that case can take the time to make an informed decision and really act in the best interest of the entire group and reduce kind of the administrative burden of chasing down everybody. But yeah, it is it is by money invested or by dollar amount, not by each individual investor. Great. And then in the calculation comparisons, um, are convertible notes treated as pre-money saves? Um, for the conversion comparisons, that's an interesting question. Let me... So I'm going to just take us back to my slide with the pre-money capitalization, post-money capitalization. So the question is really asking, my interpretation of the question is asking, well, which one of these formulas applies to notes, right? And and the answer is neither one, or really the answer is I don't know. Because remember, these formulas were derived by me taking a legal contract, which in this case are safes that are, that are posted on YC's website, reading through the legal terms and translating the legal terminology in the contract into a mathematical formula. So, you know, the reason that this pre-money safe is this pre-money safe and this post-money safe is this post-money safe is because that's what the contract says. So for your note, you'd have to go into your note and you have to do the same exercise of reading through it. Now, if you're on a kind of a standard Silicon Valley note, then typically there's going to be a section that says automatic conversion. You're going to look for some a keyword called a qualified financing, and you're going to see somebody's basically taking a mathematical formula, formula and express it in prose or kind of in natural language, which is... In fact, very unnatural for mathematics, but um, but that's how kind of legal contracting works. So you'd have to dissect that and kind of interpret it back into a formula. And then if it happened to match one of these, well, that's great. These slides would be really useful for you kind of digesting what your note governs. But I suspect that it probably wouldn't match either one of these exactly. And you'd really need to work with competent legal counsel to look at what are the specifics of that of that investment document. Awesome. All right, we're going to wrap up for today. Um, the the webinar recording will be emailed out within 48 hours, um, so you will have all of this um, meaty content to go through and listen to again. Thank you so much, Jared. Yes, thanks everyone for attending.